So welcome to Using Video Games for Educational Applications by me, Victoria Faze, uh, the owner and creator of Money Munch Kids. Uh, when I first started Money Munch Kids, which is a company dedicated to teaching kids financial education and money management, I obviously had to have a lot of creativity to be able to explain these concepts. And I wanted to carry that into other applications, uh, specifically things I was very passionate about such as the utilization of technology in education. And so I really wanted to see this kind of merger in between using video games and education, obviously, because it's what I do, as well as kind of taking that creative aspect to be able to look at basically any game and be able to use that for education. And that's kind of what this, this talk is about. So, so this in this talk, we're going to talk about how to analyze a game. Those Part of that aspect is going to be talking about what's called the gameplay loop, the story style of the game, what I have dubbed as the classification key, which is a combination of academic skills, life skills, and uh, what's called soft skills. In addition, we're also going to be talking about what's called the context of creation. I do want to give a bit of a heads up. This is not a curriculum. This isn't a use this game to teach this, this, and this. This is not a top 10 list. Uh, this lecture is specifically about how to analyze and use any game for education. And why do we want to do that is because we want to use games that our kids are already passionate about. Because if kids are passionate about something, then they're going to want to do it. A little bit of a disclaimer here. Later on, we are going to be giving some examples. And with that, that means that you are going to get some spoilers about these games. So if you're someone who really enjoys the discovery of the game, unfortunately, I just I can't really go through how to analyze a game without giving some spoilers. Let's go into the analysis. So first, I want to talk about what is a gameplay or activity loop. Uh, the gameplay loop is a game design term that is used to best describe uh, the repetitive activities that a player will take while playing a game, it defines, in essence, what the player does while playing the game. So like in Mario, you would be the character you're going, you're collecting the coins. That, that would be kind of an example of the gameplay. Like what is that repetitive action that you do? The next thing that we're going to talk about is what's called the story style analysis. A lot of people may be familiar with this, so I wanted to kind of start with this early on. So you want to ask the question, who is the protagonist? Who are the main characters? Are they flat characters? Are they there just for the gameplay? Or are they multidimensional? Do they have a backstory? Where does the story take place? You know, is it um, here on Earth? Is it on another planet? Um, where in time does it take place? So when does it take place? Is it current? Is it future? Is it past? Who are the other important characters that are featured? Um, not only in the game that you run, run into, but also on the cover art, the trailers, etc. Uh, because there's many times when a character is shown a lot like on the cover art or a trailer or posters because they're a cool looking character. But in the actual game, you don't interact with them a lot. So those are things to think about as well. Uh, what are the primary and secondary genres? And is there a narrator besides the main character? Uh, what other types of characters are there? Uh, what qualities stand out? Are there stereotypes? Are there have the the game specifically trying to not do stereotypes? Are they trying to go against uh, typical stereotypes? How is the plot structured? Uh, is it linear, chronological? Does it jump around? There are a lot of games that really love to play with the plot, want to play with that by specifically jumping you around, by giving you a sense of uncertainty. And these are very important questions you want to ask because that will tell you a lot about how you can go about analyzing the game as far as like a story style, more literature style, which is, again, most easy for a lot of adults because we've already been through this usually in like high school or college uh, literature. You, you're familiar with this. The next thing is the creator's background. So we're at this point, we're talking about the context of creation, and I'm wondering why the top hasn't, uh, the title hasn't come on. There it goes. Uh, so the context of creation is, is here. So um, what is the creator's background? Did they just create this game for um, you know fun, or was it something that they were trying to really have an impact on? Was there important aspects that went into the game that had to do with the creator's background? So who worked on it? 
Was it inspired by something? Um, was it a, re- a response to something, an event or you know, the rise of technology? Something like that would be something to take into account when thinking about the context of creation. So now we're getting into the classification key, and this is classification number one, which is that academic skills. Does the game cover anything about science, like biology, chemistry, physics? A lot of games love to play with physics, so you really want to take that into account. There's also a lot of games that have to do with like different planets, so biology is something you can also pull out there. Uh, mathematics is another one. Statistics, algebra, geometry, calculus. There's a lot of games that are, are focused around numerical values and numbers and mathematics. There's also a lot of games focused on geometry, so this is really, really good to include when thinking about how to use your game for education purposes. Another aspect is English and language. This is very important in video games because and and tends to be often overlooked because it's such a visual medium, but there are lots of games that play with language, lots of games that have their own kind of language within it, their own uh, way of speaking, which would be the audio that you'd be hearing. Some games choose to incorporate uh, voice actors and languages, scenes that are spoken. Other games choose to completely um, avoid them whatsoever, and it's all text. And other games choose to not have any uh, language interaction or they use a made up language like just sounds so this is very important it's a really really great aspect to, to think about when you're looking at different games also uh, the humanities literature and composition there are a lot of games that are based off of like old fables those are really fun to kind of tie back and compare and contrast against the original story uh, social sciences is obviously one of the next ones This is covering history, geography, economics, psychology. This has a lot, actually, in this this one category. So there are a lot of games that are based off of historical events. Um, A lot of games have some sort of economy or economics in them. You can always look at the geography of a game. And there are some games that are specifically designed to kind of like mess with your psychology or mess with how you're perceiving what's going on around you in the game and also games that are kind of there to specifically address aspects of psychology. There's a lot of fun games. Those are usually for the older kids, I will say that. And of course, one of my favorites, the liberal arts, uh, which covers art, music, theater, literature. So obviously there's going to be a lot of art aspect when dealing with video games because it's a visual medium. However, the music plays a huge role in video games. In fact, the majority of video games tend to try to inform or guide the player through their music. Our next classification key is um, life skills. So finance, obviously, is the first one that I thought of in relation to, of course, my business, Money Munch Kids. So there's a lot of games that have a form of economy in them that you have to have certain points or coins with their, or money within the game to be able to purchase things. So this is a really easy thing to incorporate. Culture is there uh, aspects of in-game culture that is not part of our current world or are you learning about another culture? There's a lot of games that incorporate that kind of um, theme. Survival skills are, are great. There's a lot of games that are in that are focused around making sure your character survives something. So they could be like in a forest or, you know, a tragedy, a natural disaster hits, um, and your character's trying to survive. And so these are really good to carry into real-world survival skills because a lot of them are relevant to that. So you like make sure you don't starve, you need fire, you need shelter, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I think we tend to forget about enjoyment, relaxation, and self-care skills in regards to life skills. Those are obviously very important to teach our children because that are the, those are the kind of skills that help them cope with stressful situations later in life. And there are a lot of games that are specifically designed to be very enjoyable, very relaxing, almost meditative. Physical fitness, you know, your characters are running around, doing things, jumping, doing, you know, essentially video game parkour. And we can easily relate those to real life activities. In fact, there are uh, a few physical fitness classes for kids that are designed around video game characters. Uh, So that's really fun. Research. There's usually in a lot of games you have to do some sort of research, fact finding, information finding. So this is a really critical skill. And this is not only through, you know, going through rooms and finding things, but also interacting with other characters, uh, which then goes into body language, which then goes into body language. And that's very important because whether we realize it or not in real world life, we do take into account someone's body language when we're speaking with them. So that's very important life skill to also incorporate. 
there are also life skills, um, which I'm not going to take as much time on, but like listening, attention to detail. And that, again, goes a little bit hand in hand with researching. Things like negotiating, planning is a huge part of a lot of skills. There are also specific games dedicated to very realistic driving skills, um, which obviously comes in handy as an adult in the real world. Uh, there's a lot of games that focus on that, like that psychology aspect of dealing with emotions and stressful situations. Independent work as well as interpersonal skills. The next classification key is soft skills. So these are like effective communication skills, dependability, adaptability, respect for others and property, empathy, teamwork and cooperation, interpersonal skills, conflict resolution, problem solving. These are obviously very much prevalent in a lot of games because a lot of games have uh, some problem solving involved with them as well as working with other in-game characters or if you allow your child to play uh, multiplayer online working with a team that you cannot absolutely control whatsoever <laughs> handling criticism that also has to deal with a lot of games and being able to work as a team flexibility uh so quickly adapting to unusual situation leadership skills a lot of video games promote leader leadership skills and that's it's obviously very important in real life creativity it, it tends to be the first thing that we think about but not necessarily one that we give a lot of credit for work ethic as well a lot of times you have to you know just keep mining away till you find that like iron ore that you need to be able to craft this thing that you want to make it's a minecraft reference there and uh, I think that again also is very um, underappreciated skill that is taught by a lot of video games so as far as the suggested order in which to use those uh, to analyze a game, I would highly suggest that you start off with the style of story, that kind of literature-based analysis that a lot of us are used to, and then move into the gameplay loop, uh, because that's something that as you're, you're looking at information and research about a game, you're going to figure that out. And then after that, you want to follow that with the classification key, those academic skills, life skills, soft skills. And then once you're done with those, look into the context of creation um, that, you know, the creator's background, because not every game has that. So I don't want you digging around like crazy for that, because I honestly think that it it probably matters the least, um, to be honest. It usually just adds a little bit more um, interesting aspects to the story, to the game, if there is any relevance to the creator, or anything special about how, how the game became a game. So before we go into the examples, I just want to point out here that if you go to YouTube and go to Money Munch Kids, uh, all you have to do is use in the search bar Money Munch Kids, you can get to our YouTube channel. And actually on our YouTube channel, we do have a list here under playlists called Video Games for Education. So those are all the videos that I use for this talk, including some uh, extra research videos that I thought might be useful to parents. So you can just go ahead to our YouTube channel. Um, Money Munch Kids and look that up yourself and uh, watch the whole list. So this is Abzu. This is rated E for everyone. The price is $20 and it is described as Abzu is a beautiful underwater adventure that evokes the dream of diving. Immerse yourself in a vibrant hidden world bursting with color and light as you descend into the heart of the ocean. But beware, as you swim deeper, dangers lurk in the depths. So Abzu's gameplay loop is basically you swim around, explore the world, and there are occasional puzzles where you learn about your environment and its inhabitants. Let's uh, forward here back. So here is your character here. We're going to jump into the style of story since we're already talking about character. Uh, the protagonist is a swimming character. Gender and species unknown. You may be a robot. The character type, initially unknown. Uh, later on we do find out it is in fact a robot and there is other tech. Some helpful, like a device that later on follows you and helps you. And some hurtful, like perhaps mines. So then we ask, how does that affect how you interpret the environment and the inhabitants in it? where obviously we're in an ocean there are later on some structures and interesting architecture when is unknown and unclear we obviously have this robot here that can swim underwater perfectly fine so it might be something uh, more futuristic but the architecture that we look at later on tends to look old like ancient cities so this does prompt some questions 
Are there other characters? Yes, there are. Obviously, there are other fish, other marine life. There is specifically a shark character, which for most of the game actually kind of harasses you and attacks you a few times. But later on, it actually, you know, sacrifices itself to save you, which is really interesting. So in that kind of way, it, it did kind of befriend you. So we want to ask also, what are the possible creatures or beings that created this ancient civilization? You know, who built these things? The general genre is exploration. Other characters, maybe other robots, we're not sure. And the plot structure is a fairly linear plot. So here's this beautiful scene with this ancient architecture here. So we're going to move on to the classification key. Academic skills, obviously we have the sciences um, because we have all this great marine life. But we also uh, want to include the liberal arts, uh, not only the visual aspect, because obviously this is visually just stunning, but we also want to think about the music here. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn my volume down and turn the music up so you guys can listen better to the music. So yeah, I mean, it has this beautiful uh, aesthetic as well as this amazing uh, audio track to go along with this game. It's absolutely just a, a stunning game. Uh, moving on to the life skills is attention to detail and listening. Obviously, again, we're bringing that back to the music, the sound that may help guide you. In addition, you know, we're exploring this world, so we do want to make sure to have attention to detail. Oh, look, it's just... It's just such a visually stunning game. I, I will never, ever get tired of watching this. We also have the aspect of relaxation and coping with stress. And I'm going to come back to that in a second when we get back to the context of creation because there, there was something specifically done with this game. One of the soft skills we have is empathy. Obviously, you know, we want to address those other characters. Specifically, I would bring about the shark. Again, that m for most of the game is kind of harassing you, but then you know, sacrifices itself. What questions could we ask there of our kids about empathy and kind of putting yourself in, in another character's shoes, so to say. We also have problem solving. There are lots of little problems and little puzzles for you to solve throughout the game as you explore the world. Uh, creative thinking. So going into the context of creation, there is a cultural aspect to this game. The game title actually stems from Sumerian mythology, particularly the myth of the ocean goddess Tiamat and the freshwater god Abzu, uniting to form all life. And the reason this was chosen was that the myths surrounding land-based life and their supposed origins in a cosmic ocean were a reoccurring theme in multiple world mythologies. So the title is actually made up of the word Ab, which means water, and Zu, which means to know. In addition, the aim from the concept of the game early on was to not simulate diving, but instead to capture the dreamlike feeling of ocean exploration. So as part of this research, I'm going to go ahead and pause this game right here. Look at the screen here. As you see, uh, there's no oxygen timer, there's no anything of any source, sort that tells you that you're running out of air or that you, you are on some sort of time limit. And the reason this is, is because as part of his research, the creator experimented with other ocean simulator games and found that they were not really what, he, what they said would be fun. So by removing any time limit or air gauge, the team that created the game sought to kind of promote this relaxing sense of exploration without having that rushing feeling that you have to get air, you have to find something. You can just really explore the world and enjoy. So now going back to that, uh, that liberal arts aspect and the music most specifically is one of the main issues was giving the player the complete freedom to swing around, including doing a full loop back where they came from. And this effect is normally held back due to camera difficulties, um, but they, the team managed to resolve this issue and allow the greater range of movement. And 
that means that they're allowing the players a, a view of the surrounding marine life and the environment the way no other ocean simulator game has before. We're going to skip ahead here to look at all this marine life that we've been seeing. Um, obviously, they're, they're fish, but what's interesting about them in the science aspect is that the types of fish seen in Abzu were actually based on real life creatures from our Earth oceans. And to fit them into the game, each species was actually distilled down to its most distinctive traits. And so the team actually has tens of thousands of fish within the game that are reflective of real Earth's uh, marine life. In addition, their actual swimming styles were based uh, and modeled directly off of the behavior and physics of real fish movements. Now I do want to circle back around to that musical liberal arts aspect uh, with the final note on Abzu here. The music actually was written from the very start to be an interactive and dynamic part of the game rather than having it based off specific cues. Uh, to achieve this, the composer actually had to play the game extensively and repeatedly to get a sense of what the players would experience and what kind of music and sounds would best match the mood of each area that you were to explore. And with that, that is Abzu. Okay, and so here we have Keep Talking and No One Explodes. This is actually both a VR and a non-VR game. This game is priced at $14 and is rated E for everyone. The game is described as the game tasks a player with disarming procedurally generated bombs with the assistance of other players who are reading a manual containing instructions. I will note for parents who may be concerned, this game does not depict violence. The screen just kind of turns to black, so there's no violence, no blood or gore, anything like that. The gameplay loop is basically a puzzle solving game while communicating and fighting against the clock. The style of story, the protagonist is you, where we're in some sort of bomb room or escape room. Uh, the other characters are your team, so this is a multiplayer game. The genre is action comedy. Oh, one note here in regards to the multiplayer uh, game, it is not a multiplayer online game. You have to be playing there in person. The plot structure is uh, linear. It's real time happening. The classification key now, uh, we're going into the academic skills. I'm going to be honest with you guys, this game is pretty low on academic skills. Uh, it is pretty good with life skills though. It does very, very much teach coping stress, time management, following directions, listening and attention to detail, as well as research. So when you're playing this game in a non-VR setting, obviously there are some really good soft skills here. One is effective communication, teamwork, interpersonal skills, leadership. In any time that I've played this game, there's always usually one person who ends up being the leader of trying to figure out which Part of the puzzle they can solve first and or instructing the other members to look up this part of the puzzle or that while they're trying to figure out one of the other puzzles uh, and obviously with that there is problem solving the context of creation here is uh, fairly interesting though not as nearly as in depth as, as abzu this is not the, the company's first vr game and it is in fact designed to be played multiplayer in real time in real life and what i love in particular and i think is a really good conversation topic for this game is the fact that there's this real merge between real life and the the virtual world the video game so you have to have people helping you right there in real life with tangible instructions while you're playing this video game i think that's a very very interesting kind of meld between the two next we have the game occupy white walls this game is free on computer on pc the rating is unknown as of now and it is described as to say it is a PC sandbox building AI driven MMO where people play with art developed by folks who really love architecture and abstract characters would be a bit of a mouthful. Before I get into more about this game, I, I just also want to know that this is actually the game that actually spurred this talk. I love playing this game, Occupy White Walls. And to explain what the game is to you, you, very similar to other sandbox building games, like maybe Minecraft you might be familiar with, uh, are able to build a structure in this game. The structure is, in fact, an art museum. You start off with this kind of blank space in the void of nether and are able to then have some of the the building blocks available to you already to start building the game building your your art museum and as you build it you are also able to purchase more art how you actually are able to purchase art is really interesting in this game there is no real money you cannot put real money into this game to be able to advance you have to put the time and the love and the passion 
in this game to be able to unlock other levels, which means there are also no loot boxes. So here we'll see uh, the other parts of the buildings that you can purchase, your in-game money, and how you earn money in-game is also really interesting. Once you start building your art museum, finished or not, it is open to the quote-unquote public, which may be AI. Usually it's, it's mostly AI, but there are some real players, uh, so it is online multiplayer. But when people or AI characters come to your art museum, you automatically earn money. So let's get into the analysis, huh? The gameplay loop, I said it's a sandbox building game. You buy art to get more visitors which earns you in-game currency, which expands and upgrades your gallery of things that you can use to build your art museum. It is mostly classical or modern art that you would actually see in museums. So these are real art history pieces. The style of the story, you are the protagonist. There are some skins that you can purchase where it's pretty much just a blank building space uh, until you build something when not a clue, nowhere. Other characters, as I said, there's AI and there's uh, real people. The genre is creativity and the plot structure, there's really no plot. So the classification key is academic. Obviously there are academic skills such as the liberal arts and the social sciences. And I do want to point this out here. When you purchase a piece of art, or if you go and look, have a closer look at a piece of art in galleries, it will show you, and you can you might be able to kind of see this, it shows you the title of the piece, who is the artist, what's the medium. It will also show you any comments that people have left on the art piece. Let's move on to another one so we can see a little more. It'll show you the dimensions sometimes, when the date was, if that's known, and if there is one, a description of the art piece. So it gives you quite a bit of information about these arts, so it is very educational in that sense. Life skills, obviously we're dealing with finance because you have to purchase different art pieces. In addition, we have an obvious reference to various cultures, social skills because you can interact and speak with people in the game. The game itself is extremely relaxing. There's obviously aspects of planning and resource management. The soft skills that are involved in this game, respect for others and other people's property. There is in fact no way to vandalize anyone's art gallery. It's, it's physically impossible in the game. Another soft skill will be creativity, effective communication skills, like I said, the community is very good. Uh, they do want to help you expand your gallery for the most part. And so there have been many times when I st started playing this game early on and I was like, well, how, how did you get this? How did you get that? Whether it was a piece of art or a piece of uh, building to create a structure, they were very helpful in being like, okay, that's on level this, oh, that's on level that, or how, how did you find it? How did you get it? There is a little bit of context of creation here for this game, which is that the creators believe that the art market is already cynical, patronizing, unethical, and generally geared toward the very, very rich. And they didn't see a point in making an online art fantasy land like that too. So Occupy White Walls uh, is designed to be a far cry away as much as possible from the social casino and kind of pay to win, which is why there's no ability to purchase anything with real money. It was designed specifically to be fair to play, which means that Occupy White Walls has no loot boxes, there's no real money, or anything required to buy any of the in-game elements except for playing the game. Oh look, there you go, we have more mango, we just passed it. The next game I want to talk about it here is Overcooked. So this is Overcooked. This is, I believe, normal speed, and uh, the price for this is $16.99. It's rated E for everyone, and it's described as Overcooked is a chaotic couch co-op cooking game for one to four players. Working as a team, you and your fellow chefs must prepare, cook, and serve up a variety of tasty orders before the banging customers storm out and huff. So the suggested is two to four players. The gameplay loop is basically an order comes in. Each order is comprised of individual components. Each component must be prepared differently. Some, like the onions here, need to be chopped. Others need to be fried. Some need to be chopped then fried. And some need no prep at all. Once prepared, the components must be combined on a plate, and the plate must then be delivered to the conveyor belt, which takes the meal out to the customer. The customer will scarf down their food, and they return the dirty plate, which then must be scrubbed before it can be returned to active duty. So, I mean, obviously you can already hear some, see some life skills going on here, but we'll get to that in a second. So the style of story, uh, the protagonists are you and your friends, who are the chefs. The character type, there's characters that are human, and non-human characters, male and fe female, with and without glasses, different ethnicities. And I think uh, one character is in a wheelchair. I also think one character is a raccoon, if I remember correctly. Where it takes place is in various odd kitchens that are like kind of like pop-up style restaurants. When is unknown. 
other characters are customers or managers, but we do really don't interact with them at all. The genre is kind of a DIY workplace humor with a bit of fantasy. The plot structure, there really isn't one. I mean, it's pretty linear as far as you're moving from one kitchen to the other, but besides that, there isn't a lot of, you know, plot to go through. You're just trying to move on to the next level. The classification key, uh, the only academic skill that I could pull from here is that there might be some chemistry. Life skills, obviously, we have home economics or cooking. We have listening, so when you're communicating with your other players, so paying attention to detail. We'll also be doing a lot of planning as well. Obviously, usually when I play the game, uh, there'll be one person's in charge of, like, chopping, one person's in charge of something else. So there's a lot of planning uh, and co-op as well as well as other life skills is, is coping with stress you are on a timer as you can see in the bottom right hand corner uh, so time management skills and it does get pretty hectic and uh, so you're gonna need to keep organized soft skills is and I want to highlight this effective communication under pressure uh, usually when I played this game it tends to turn into like a screaming mess so you want to make sure that you're communicating effectively. Teamwork, handling criticism, and you generally there's one person who kind of leads the team and that's the leadership skills as well. There is a bit of context of creation here. Um, the kitchen setting was based on the creator's past experience as a chef. According to the creator, kitchens have always stuck with them as a perfect analogy for a cooperative game. An occupation where teamwork, time management, spatial awareness, and shouting are vitally important. The initial level designs were created to emphasize that there's a need to work together. So they start off pretty slow. This is one of the higher levels. And a kitchen would include generally more tasks than a single chef is able to do. So that the players cannot really stay at one single station. You have to move around. So this is a game that kind of pushes you and pushes your speed and ability to plan as well. But to keep the game simple, they eliminated a kind of life-based system in favor for a scoring-based system so that players didn't feel pressured by making small mistakes and it was less penalty or less penal system and more reward-based. So there's also a lot of lessons there in dealing with failure as well. Don't starve, or another version of it is don't starve together, which obviously together implying multiplayer aspect. The price for this game is $10.99 to $14.99. The rating is T for teen. The game is described uh, as don't starve follows a scientist named Wilson, which Wilson, that would be this boy here, who finds himself in a dark, dreary world and must survive as long as possible. To this end, the player must keep Wilson healthy, fed, and mentally stable as he avoids a variety of surreal and supernatural enemies that will try to kill him and devour him. So this is obviously um, in its style-esque, it's, it's almost Tim Burton-esque in its style. Uh, the game loop here is that the game relies on a kind of day and night cycle which causes meaningful fluctuations in the gameplay. During the day, the player spend mo spends most of their time exploring the world, gathering food, firewood, and other resources, discovering or crafting recipes to combine uh, available items and avoiding enemies. With nightfall comes dangerous monsters and an invisible menace who attacks the player when the screen has gone pitch dark. A player must have a light source or night vision to prevent it from attacking. So as you see, there's a lot to do here. Uh, each in-game day is about eight minutes of real time, just so you know. The style of story, obviously there are different protagonists. Wilson is the main one, but there are a few other characters that you can play as you unlock different levels. The character type, uh, he's a gentleman scientist and is the protagonist of Don't Starve where it's some sort of made up planet when unknown the genre is kind of like this open world survival game as far as the classification key goes the academic skills here are obviously science language language that is in the game is kind of like this weird wonky language like you would hear the adults of the peanuts uh, tv show social sciences we deal with psychology as keeping your character in the dark does affect their mental state geography a little bit of art both in the music and style there's also some of the shorts that you can go look as far as to have some background on the characters and that's what you're seeing on screen right now life skills there's obviously the aspect of survival skills uh, relaxation i find this game to be very relaxing the the resource gathering portion of the game is a lot of fun for me physical fitness so you can relate this a lot to camping and own the actual real life physical survival. There's also planning, attention to detail, and a lot of independent work as you can play both independently and multiplayer. Soft skills, uh, there's teamwork if you're playing Don't Starve Together, adaptability, creativity, uh, empathy. There are a lot of other animals and creatures in the game that can help you or hurt you. And you can befriend various animals as well. 
So as far as the context of creation, the game was conceived at the height of the game industry trend of dropping players into a world with very few instructions and the goal and giving the goal of survival. This game was heavily influenced by Minecraft, which spearheads the trend, as well as the filmmaker uh, Tim Burton. So right, like I said, it has that you know Tim Burton esque feel. So here we have another great game called Rock of Ages. Note that there is actually a Rock of Ages 2. Uh, Rock of Ages and Rock of Ages 2 are both priced at $9.99. They're rated E for everyone and is defined as a rock solid combination of rock rolling, fun, deep strategy, captivating art and music from different ages of history. This is a game of crush or be crushed. So the gameplay loop is you build your defenses, you defend your area, you navigate or race a boulder and try to smash the enemy's gates. The style of story here, we can see our protagonist, which is Sisyphus, a cruel Greek king who was punished to push a large rock up a steep hill, only to find it rolling back as he neared the top. Ever since, he has been known to be pushing the rock tirelessly through eternity. Now, in Rock of Ages 2, the actual main character is Atlas, uh, which is one of the titans who was responsible for bearing the weight of the heavens on his shoulders, a burden which was given to him as punishment by Zeus. The characters are characters from ancient history or mythology with a ton of rich backstory to them. Where, obviously, we can see that we're on this kind of platform area which resembles places through history. There's no specific date as it jumps around a lot. The other characters are generally fun depictions of historical or fictional characters, like obviously there's Hades, Sisyphus, there's also Agamemnon, Zeus, the plague, God from Da Vinci's Sistine Chapel, Joan of Arc, Van Gogh, Henry VIII, etc. The genre is a loosely based historical comedy. The plot structure, you move around through different uh, levels that are based on various periods in history, but not necessarily in chronological order. The classification key, obviously when we're starting off in the academic skills area, there's a lot to pull from here. We have not only the liberal arts, like art, art history, etc., but also the social sciences with history, geography. We also can pull in uh, from English language because there are a lot of literary characters through these games as well. The next skill set is the life skills. We obviously have a lot of culture here that we can pull from. This is also just a really fun kind of relaxing game where you're, you're just, it's just pure fun of just trying to get, get through the maze of the level that you're on and kind of be creative when it comes to building your defenses. So as we can see here, you are building your own defenses and everything of course costs in-game money. And you get in-game money by playing the game. You're actually not able, similarly to Occupy White Walls, you're not able to put outside money into this game. Uh, you just have to play it and it kind of feeds itself. As far as soft skills, we have interpersonal skills. Not only can you play this game against the AI, but you can also play two-player. So that's really fun. Uh, so it does encourage good sportsmanship and creative problem solving. So as far as the context of creation, there isn't a lot that I was able to pull from, but I do want to again highlight that there, this game really takes a creative spin on how it represents different characters through history, through mythology, etc. So the next game I want to talk about is Assassin's Creed Unity. The price ranges from $10 to $40 depending on which version you get. The rating is M for Mature. Assassin's Creed is defined as Assassin's Creed Unity tells the story of Arno, a young man who embarks upon an extraordinary journey to expose the true powers behind the French Revolution. In the brand new co-op mode, you and your friends can also be thrown into the middle of a ruthless struggle for the fate of a nation. So the gameplay loop here is generally you're wandering around the world or you find a mission you get to the mission's location, you sneak in and either steal, free, or assassinate somebody before escaping to receive a reward and progress to the next part of the story. The style of story, the protagonist is Arno, the character type. He's a French-Austrian assassin during the French Revolution. He was born in France in 1768. He seeks revenge for the, his dead father against the organization his adopted father helps run. Where are we? We're obviously in France when during the French Revolution. Other characters, there are various other characters including historical French figures such as Napoleon and Robespierre. The genre is Assassin's Creed Unity is generally considered an action adventure stealth game set in a open world environment. The plot structure is also mostly linear. We have some really amazing graphics in this game. As far as the classification key, for academic skills we have the social sciences such as history, geography. We also have the liberal arts and art history. In the game you're definitely going to be addressing pieces of literature, 
composition, life skills. Um, there's obviously a lot of culture. You can encourage your children to use physical fitness, as we see in, in the game here. There's a lot of crouching. There's a lot of jumping. There's a lot of being able to balance. So you can actually incorporate that into an outdoor routine where you encourage your children to be able to have the same skills as the characters in the video games. Of course, we're not going to ask them to jump off buildings or anything, but, you know, they can crouch, they can run, they can balance. Mm -hmm. There's also listening and attention to detail uh, as well as planning. You're going to need to be able to get in and out of certain areas, so that's very important in planning your, you know, your escape route and planning how you're going to get the mission done, etc. Soft skills, there is adaptability, teamwork, and cooperation. If you're playing multiplayer, conflict resolution, so you're trying to sometimes get out of places as quickly as possible without dealing with a conflict or being involved in a conflict. Respect for others, property, and stealth. So there's actually been said that when you play this game, if you go into a room and move something, the characters in the game will notice. So if you're going around and you know vandalizing rooms, you're going to get caught. As far as the context of creation, Assassin's Creed covers a variety of different locations during major historical periods. And they actually have a really good idea and, a, and an amazing way to actually capture what it's like to be in that place. A lot of people have said that it's almost identical to being there in person. Assassin's Creed has actually been credited with being so realistic in their depictions of the real world geography that as you can see that here, that's actually Notre Dame. In fact, that is the exact sp spire that burned down um, during the Notre Dame fires. And so they're actually partnering with the French government to be able to use the scans that they have to help rebuild Notre Dame, which is fascinating and absolutely amazing. There is also a version of Assassin's Creed that you can play that you're just going through the world. You don't have to play the actual game, so you can just walk through the world. Uh, the next game I wanted to talk about is Planet Coaster, and this is the trailer for it, actually. Uh, the Planet Coaster is priced at $45. It's rated E for everyone, and Planet Coaster is described as the future of coaster park simulation games has arrived. Surprise, delight, and thrill incredible crowds as you build your coaster park empire. Let your imagination run wild and share your success with the world. So the gameplay loop, there isn't necessarily a loop per se, but before starting the game, everyone must create their own avatar, which is very customizable, and is the only thing that absolutely everyone does. Planet Coaster is a construction and management simulator video game, similar to uh, its predecessor, Roller Coaster Tycoon. The game allows players to build different theme park rides and roller coasters, which requires different actions, hence there's no actual loop. Player-created attractions can be shared through a mechanic called the Global Village, so you can open up your park for other people to see, if you choose to. Uh, afterwards, the player is able to choose between three game modes. Sandbox, which is, you know, it's a sandbox game. Challenge, which the game will give you a challenge, and career. A sandbox mode players are tasked to construct their own theme park off an empty plot of land. Challenge is similar to a sandbox mode, but with added difficulty as players need to take funds into account. In career mode, players assume the role of the theme park manager and must complete tasks such as constructing unfinished roller coasters or hiring on new staff. The style of story, the protagonist is you, which is the builder. The character type, there's no real background. It's very customizable, height, weight, gender, hair, clothes, etc. Really, you're really free to express yourself in your avatar, but this isn't really used a lot in the game. Other characters, there is the global village that I mentioned, which is sharing uh, your park with the world. But it is not multiplayer. You can't play with other people. You can simply allow other people to see your coaster. And you never really ever need to be online to play after you finish installing. So that's really great. The genre is kind of a DIY science fiction thriller. The plot structure, there really isn't one. Um, so we're going to move on and says the classification key. As far as academic skills, there's a lot of science involved, physics, mathematics, statistics. So once you start getting into playing those modes like the challenge mode, you're going to have to deal with the numbers that it shows you on how to run the park as far as funds that you're earning from the park existing and customers coming to ride your roller coasters and what you have to pay for staff, expenses, etc. And of course that really easily translates into, into the social sciences with economics. And of course, there's also a liberal arts aspect, which is the art aspect of it, the music, um, the creativity. Then we also have life skills. Obviously, we kind of touched on this previously, but there is a lot of finance involved in this game. I really enjoy that you have to pay people a salary and there are expenses that you have to account for and keep an eye on. Otherwise, your park will go broke. <laughs> 
There's environmental and social skills. So you want to take into account the environment of the park because the more attractive your park looks, the more people are willing to pay and the more customers you're going to get, which makes you earn more money. This is, however, an extremely enjoying and relaxing game. Uh, it's, it very much allows you to be creative and to just enjoy the game and the, the game building aspect. There is also uh, a lot of ability to zoom into your park. So you can actually zoom in and like see the k different people coming to your park and, and actually watch them as they either enjoy or get upset about what's going on. So you can also uh, attribute some body language. With that, there is attention to detail. You are able to see some a lot of detail in this game. And obviously there is a lot of independent work. As far as soft skills, there is adaptability. You also have to be able to handle criticism because you do get feedback on your rides and on your park. You also have to problem solve if you're playing like career mode where you may end up just being given a, a ride that's broken. There is a sense of leadership as this is your responsibility and a lot of creativity. Planet Coaster features an adaptive soundtrack composed by Jim Guthrie and J.J. Ibsen, which released under the album titled You, Me, and Gravity, the music of Planet Coaster. Additionally, players can upload their own sound files to use in their parks, which is really cool because it allows you to really customize the experience. The next game I want to talk about is Geometry Rolls. This was actually a game that was picked by my husband. He loves this game. It's actually only $3.99 and ready to eat for everyone. It's called Geometry Wars Retro Evolved. It's an old school style shooter, but remixed with a 21st century and next generation graphics and deep modern gameplay. Playing is simple. You are a geometric ship trapped in a grid world, facing off against waves of deadly wanderers, snakes, and repulsors. So obviously it explained the game right there. That is the gameplay loop. You just want to try to make your little uh, geometric character survive as long as possible and score as many points as possible while destroying the ever-increasing swarm of enemies. So this takes place on a rectangular playing field, um, and the player controls the claw-shaped ship that can move around in basically any direction and can fire in any direction independently as well. If an enemy touches your, your player's ship, the ship explodes and your life is lost. The game is over when the player run out, runs out of lives. So as far as the style of story, there isn't a lot to go off of here. This is very reminiscent of the old arcade game, so it's a lot of fun for players of all ages. But the protagonist is obviously the geometric ship, the character type there is none, we might be in space, we don't know when we are. The other characters would be classified as like the enemy ships. The genre, it is a very much of an action-based game, and the plot structure is level-based. The classification key, uh, as far as life skills, this game is heavily based on that kind of flow state, just react, don't think about it aspect, and it, it is actually t called the flow state, so you do have to be kind of relaxed but paying attention in great detail. You also need to learn uh, coping with stress, because there it gets pretty intense, obviously, as you can see here. Soft skills, I would say determination and work, that work ethic. The context of creation is a throwback to those old arcade games like Space Invaders or Asteroids. So those are the examples for using video games for educational applications by me, Victoria Haza. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me at Facebook or Instagram at the account for Money Munch Kids. You can also go ahead onto our site, and we also have tons of games that kids can play to learn about money. So thanks so much.